All right, ready? Sure. Okay. Um, I just want to start out, um, you know, after you completed college, you know, from Denison University, you know, I read in your bio you took a job fixing uh, copiers, but, you know, your, your passion for music was always there. You know, just tell me a little bit about what was going through your head at, at this time. You know, you had got your music degree, but you weren't in music. Well, um, after I got the music degree, the, the, the job that I took at that time, I never, ever considered for a second that I wouldn't wind up doing music. Not for one second. I mean, to me, I had my own studio that I put together, and so I had to, like, have a day job to pay the bill. Yeah. So I was working in the studio at night okay. and then working the day job from the day. So I never for a second thought that I was going to, you know, it was strictly just to get money. Mm -hmm. And so... I actually was writing, my songwriting partner at the time was a guy named Foley, and um, he wound up leaving to go play with Miles Davis. Oh, wow. And um, at the time, I took a music director job for uh, a one-act wonder, a one-hit one wonder group called Teen Dream, who signed the Warner Brothers back then, and I was their musical director. Okay. And so I kind of, I still had some things going on musically mm -hmm. um, to where I had enough you know, stuff to, to do to where I, I hadn't really lost hope, but the, the copier job was strictly just for money. I never thought for a second that <laughs> I wasn't going to wind up playing music. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned um, you were working as a musical director for, um, uh, what was the name of the group again? I'm sorry. Te a group called Teen Dream. Okay. Just tell me a little bit about... I had a song called... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to ask, um, you know, what's your role... As a, as a musical director working with a group because I'm just you know curious um, mostly you know it, it, it depends a lot on what the group needs um, for, for that group because they were kids um, you know I had to basically get them up to the point where they had a live show you know because they make the records and you know producers can do whatever they do to make a record in the studio but then you know somebody has to get the act to the point where they have a live show and they can actually go out and perform those records. So as a musical director, I had to, to hire and train the band, you know, basically give a vocal coach the girls so that they could, you know, sing their parts and just basically get them up to speed. Now, being a musical director for Gerald was a little different because he was a guy that brought a lot more to the table and had his own ideas about what he wanted and you were just a, kind of the guy to, to, to make it happen. But with these girls, I had to pretty much do everything, come up with the arrangements, you know, uh, make sure the band was rehearsed, teach them their parts, um, just everything as it relates to taking an act that has a record and making sure that they can actually perform those songs live. Yeah, okay, cool. So the, the, the music degree did come in handy at that point, just being able to, to, to do, you know, vocal training and vocal coaching and being able to write out parts, you know, yeah. for band members and all of that stuff, because once you get to that level, you know, rehearsals are costly. It's not like a garage band or basement band where you guys get together for fun of it. Once you're at that level, okay. we are rehearsing as long as you want to. So you got to send out charts and somebody has to write those charts out. And you have to be very prepared when you start rehearsing, you know, because you're paying for a rehearsal space. You may be paying a sound company. It's just costly at that point. Yep. Okay, cool. And... Eventually, um, you know, you were working with Gerald Levert, and, then, and that's someone I was reading whose music you grew up admiring. So just tell me, like, what is it like, you know, having the opportunity to work with someone like that whose music you grew up on? Um, it was like Christmas every day mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways because that guy, um, he, he had a very, very strong work ethic. So... All the while we were working, you never got a chance to stop and, and think about it because he was always busy trying to do the next thing. Okay. I mean, that guy was just, you know, really incredible in that way. Yeah. Um, and so a, a person coming from my background where, you know, I worked eight hours a day at a, at a day gig and then I spent eight hours a night at my studio, you know, I was used to 
Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what what um, you know caused us to be able to get along well musically. Yeah. Um, but it was like you know because I came from Columbus, we just didn't really know. I mean, I knew some of the guys were in like Rick James band, and um, I met Jonathan Moffat, who wound up playing with the Jacksons. I actually was supposed to do uh, Michael Jackson's last tour as a drummer. Oh wow. Um, I mean, yeah, like I knew sort of guys like that. There was a guy named Skip Anderson that left to go play with Luther Vandross and was with him for a while. But for the most part, we didn't really know people like Gerald. Mm-hmm. There weren't a lot of people from Columbus at that time. So for me to have access to a guy like that, it was like, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was like, you know, what I would have expected, you know, if I had moved to L.A. or New York or something. Yeah. So I was pretty happy about it all. I mean, it's, it's still probably the single life-changing thing that's happened thus far mm-hmm. and you know since you've had a chance to work with him extensively um can you share with me a memory or or something you remember most about him and your time spent with him um there's so many yeah. i tell you i tell you one that was really funny because i learned a, i learned a valuable lesson from that musically um because me coming from a guy that started out in the 80s in the music thing, you know, that's when sequences and drum machines and all of that stuff became, you know, prevalent and popular and sort of like what auto-tune is now. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when something first gets introduced in the music, people take it too far. And so with that stuff, you have the, the possibility of making things perfect because you can sequence it. I mean, you can do it over and over and over again until it's right. It wasn't like the 70s where, you know, you just play the tracks down. You know, you could like, you know, make it correct. The, the drum machines you can make it perfect. So we were working on some songs for like Keith Washington, I believe. Okay. And he put the ideas down, and we got it. You know, either got the ideas down. He left for the day. I stayed up all night perfecting those tracks, mm-hmm. getting them. You know, correcting all the little mistakes we made. You know, and I was you know happy to play it for him the next day. And um, you know, he's like, yeah, man, that sounds great. Luckily, I had saved, the, you know, the track I started with, and so I had to put it back, you know, and he said, yeah, you made it perfect, but you took all the feeling out of it because you made it perfect. Oh, wow. And so I learned a lesson from that, that, that sometimes when something feels good, that's more important than it being technically correct. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. Um, can you just share with me also, like, the process when you're making a record, producing a record, you know, the thought process and the in the work you put in from start to finish, basically just, you know, the overall start to finish of it, just a brief overview? Well, because all records don't start in the same way. Mm-hmm. Not these things don't start in order, but, but basically um, I'm looking to say something that everybody can identify with, yeah. but may not necessarily have been said that way, mm-hmm. which is a tricky thing because there's not a whole lot. There are certain, certain things that we sing about all the time, but there are certain things we say all the time, but we don't necessarily sing about them. Yeah. Um, so that when a person hears you sing that thing, it may be something very familiar to them because of something they've said all the time, but maybe nobody thought to make a song of it. Or you have to just figure out how to say something 
they got to do to you to make you sound like the vision that's in their head, then so be it. But sometimes I think they don't necessarily concentrate enough on giving the artist their own thing so that they have no, per se, identifiable sound. Yeah. And so you become an artist that's, that's um, you're subject to whatever hit you may have at any given point, but nobody can figure out what you stand for because you are almost a reflection of the producer more so than of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I see that happen in a lot of music nowadays. I don't think that people are doing it maliciously or, or selfishly. They're just not thinking about it that way. And like, I'm here to, to advance the career of this artist, this musician. I need to make sure, first and foremost, that the record I make is, is, is giving that artist some voice. Mm -hmm. You know, from that point, everything, you know, else after that is, is, um, is up for grabs in terms of how it's approached. But those are the things that, that matter the most to me when I make a record. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, coming out of Cleveland, um, you know, what was it like? Because when you think of Cleveland, you don't necessarily think of, you know, big music scene. You, you mainly think New York, uh, California. You know, did, what was it like coming out of Cleveland, growing up in the music scene? Did you see a lot of talent around you? You know, just comment on that if you could. Well, um, it might not be fair for me to totally answer that because I didn't grow up in Cleveland. I actually oh, moved sorry. to Cleveland specifically to work with Gerald. I was actually living in Columbus. Oh, I um, but when I when I got to Cleveland, you know, there was a whole bunch of music happening in Cleveland, and there was a lot of people from Cleveland that just didn't stay because they couldn't they felt they couldn't make their careers happen mm -hmm. in Cleveland. But there was a lot of a lot of folks from there. I was surrounded by. Um, you know, at that time, the Rude Boys were just getting started, Men at Large was just getting started. I worked on their albums initially, LaVert was around, the OJs were around, the Daz Band was still doing their thing. Um, not too long after that, Avant got going, um, Howard Hewitt, the song right up the street. Um, there were, you know, there were folks around, and when I was down in Columbus, um, you know, I used to run down to Dayton all the time, and, you know, Roger Trotman and those guys were down there, and there was a lady from my church choir, believe it or not, who started singing with Roger and those guys named Shirley Murdoch. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, they, 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 I mean, there were folks around, you know, so it, it, I just, it, 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 it was all always sort of a desire on my part to try to make the music scene on the professional side, you know, step up. Because the talent was here, but people didn't stay because they felt like they couldn't, they couldn't make the career happen mm -hmm. from where they were. But there, there were people around. Yeah. I mean, there's still a crazy amount of talent in this town. It's just, you know, the great ones just don't stay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, and also, you know, I was reading in your bio, you produced uh, six songs on Joe's debut album, and he's a personal favorite of mine, and you also did uh, his big hit, I Want to Know. Um, you know, I just would, would like to know, what was it like working with him? Well, that's funny, actually, that, you know, the, the bio thing is actually a little bit incorrect because... It wasn't Joe's debut album, it was actually his second album because he had a first album, I think it was on Polygram or something that didn't really do too much. Oh, okay. But it was the, it was kind of like his breakout album, which was actually the sophomore album called All That I Am. Okay. And um, working with Joe was really, really cool because the kid's crazy talented. But the funny part is I actually wound up working with him as a favor um, oh. to a girl I was dating at the time, named Peace <laughs> Williams. And she was managing um, Joe. And I guess Joe had taken some, uh, he'd gotten into dance from Jive and hadn't turned in any music. So she asked me to help him finish one song just because she was going to these two creative meetings and they kept asking, where's the Joe? Or did he have anything? He had anything? She never had anything to turn in and no updates or whatever. So just kind of to keep her from looking bad, uh, she asked me to help him at least get one song done. And it actually wound up being a title song, uh, All That I Am. Yeah. And the president of Jive at the time, Clyde Calder, heard the song and asked me to help. Joe finished the album, yeah. so that's how I wound up um, finishing the record, and, and out of the six songs, one of them was actually one um, that I did with Joe, called uh, How So, okay. but um, Joe was a talented guy, but, you know, funny, um, I Want to Know was supposed to be on that album, Oh wow! but Peace asked me to play live bass on the record, Joe, I think, resented the fact that Peace was involved on the music side of stuff because he felt that that should have been his call mm -hmm. and they couldn't agree so he took the song off the album wow. and it wound up being used four years later 
Yeah. When he needed a song for a soundtrack and didn't have anything to send, and that was laying around, so he sent it, and it and it did well. Yeah. But at that time, working with um, Joe, I was actually working with Joe during the day from maybe eleven o'clock in the morning to seven at night. Mm-hmm. I would rush to the airport, catch the eight forty flight to New York. I would work with Joe from about ten o'clock to, to at night till five o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about your company, uh, iBrighton, and how you started it, and what your plans, you know, in the future are for it. iBrighton is a company that that that, that was started, you know, two years ago, and it's it's basically um, something that I plan to have as a vehicle to concentrate on artists like Vesta, artists um, like Eddie Levert, who I plan to be making a record on, and various other friends of mine who are in situations where maybe a major looks at them and says, well, you know, maybe your sales wouldn't be enough for me to be interested in you, but but it's, but it's first of all, it's enough to interest me simply because I like the music that they make. I personally believe that there's still a market out there for, for good grown-up R&B music. I just believe there is. I mean, and I think that majors have to concentrate on their bottom line and that they, and that they have to spend $500,000 who's 18 and may not be a seasoned veteran artist but they could sell more records mm-hmm. versus person B who may sell less records but um, you know it may be a better record they have to kind of do you know option A because their mandate is to make money that's what they're there to do yeah. and so I'm at a place career wise where I feel like I can take those projects simply for the because of the love of the music and because I believe there's a demand out there for it. Mm-hmm. And so this company is, is going to concentrate solely on stuff like that. Okay. And just for people that I've always wanted to record, like Vesta is a person I always wanted to make a record on. And I actually was supposed to make a record on her in in the 90s. Yeah. Um, Andre Fisher had hired me, but you know he got fired before we got a chance to make the record. Mm-hmm. That was in 95, I want to say. Um, so she and I have talked about it for years. She's the first artist, you know, that, I, that I'm going to put out, but... Okay. Well... It was like, yeah, it was like working with somebody older. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he's just an old soul. And I mean, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Um, my, when I first came to Cleveland, I actually started writing initially with Eddie. Mm-hmm. And, um... And so he was the one that suggested to Gerald that Gerald give me a shot to write with him. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, these are the folks that, you know, the, the music that I grew up on, I just always wanted to, to do records with them, and I'm just having a ball, man, because it's just, you know, to work with somebody you idolized when you were, you know, when you were a kid, there's just no better feeling than that. Yeah. Definitely. No. And I believe there's a market for the music. I just believe that. And it may not necessarily be the same market that, you know, Little Wayne may enjoy or Lady Gaga, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. There are people that do that, and I want to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I was reading that in your bio about how you felt, you know, labels are focusing more on younger artists and prefabricated pop stars, and I, I fully agree. I just wanted to get your opinion 
you know, do you think real R&B music, which I'm a huge fan of myself, um, you know, ever prominently have a place again in the mainstream, maybe on the radio? You know, because right now it's it's definitely not like it used to be. Absolutely. Everything that's new becomes old and everything that's old becomes new again. Mm -hmm. And there's going to come a point when, uh, because, because here's the thing, whenever a trend starts in music, everybody jumps on the bandwagon until they run it in the ground and they look for something new. So what's going on musically now, people are inevitably going to get tired of it. Yep. And I hear young cats saying to me now, you know, that they, they want to get a band together and go in the studio and just cut their tracks, you know, live and all that stuff. And they think it's like a new phenomenal new thing. And it's <laughs> like, dude, that's the way it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it, it's inevitable that it comes back because you know, the other thing can only go so far. You can only take it so far before it ceases to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And live music, stuff that's played live, you know, it's, it, it, it's definitely, you know, the church is producing all of these musicians, you know, because for a while that was the only place people could play. You know, there weren't any club gigs. You know, if you were black, there were no club gigs, you know, per se. Um, you know, the, the pro gigs are, few, you know, there's not that many of them, so the church has been producing, and plus the music in the church is so um, unrestricted, I'll use that word, that, um, you know, the church is producing a lot of young musicians who, who want outlets to do what they do, and, and they don't want to play that stuff here on the radio with just like a clap going and some auto-tune vocal. That's not interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to look for outlets to do their thing, and they are the ones that's going to bring you know, the, the, the newer music, you know, it's just going to be what the old music was, but it's going to be a younger voice singing it, and so it'll suddenly be new. Mm -hmm. We don't know that it's not new, but we'll keep our mouths shut yeah. and let them think that they've done something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going to happen. I mean, it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, hypothetically speaking, and this might be a little bit tough to answer, but say that no artist you know, out right now we're currently signed to any record label and you could add any five artists to your I Brighton uh, roster. You know, can you tell me who they would be? Ooh, that is tough. <laughs> because there's some folks that are already signed, but I would tell you there are people who I've always wanted to work with. I've always wanted to work with Aretha, Aretha Franklin, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I like Glenn Jones' voice. Mm -hmm. I love Shaka Khan. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some younger folks that I really, really like, like Dave Hollister. I love his voice. Yeah. Um, you know, Stokely from In Condition, who's actually a very good friend of mine. I love his voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, the, and these are not necessarily the older people, but I like what they do. Yeah. And I think that, you know, given the right opportunity to make something happen, that that that, that I would love to, to do records with them. You know, whether that will, will or will not happen, you know, remains to be seen, but... There's probably so many that I couldn't even, you know, like I would hear somebody on the radio and say, you know what, you're on the radio, but but I would love to make a better record for you than the one I hear because you're better than that. I think Timo Bryson is a is somebody that, that you know, would, would be great for him to have a great record right now. Will Downing, I mean, Will's probably got a, got a, um, got a thing going on right now, but, you know, Eddie is, you know, I'm, I'm itching to make this Eddie LeVert record because, you know, I, I feel like I know what kind of record he needs to make. Yeah. There's just so many out there that ain't even funny. But, yeah. um, hopefully that's, that's a few. Yeah, okay, good. And, you know, do you have a favorite song that you may have produced or worked on? That one I probably feel like I haven't made it yet. Okay. Because um, I feel like the things that I've done thus far, most of them to me were almost like works for hire in the sense that that particular artist was looking for a specific thing and I tried my best to provide that which they were, were you know, want, wanting, mm -hmm. but I feel like the best work that's in me hasn't been released yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, you know, I, that's hard to say. I mean, a, a lot of what I did with Gerald I'm very proud of. Um, but I feel like I haven't done my best work yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, 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 it's to be announced. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And just uh, one last question for you. You know, as a producer and uh, a songwriter, you know, when you make a song for an artist and, and you know, basically do the work behind the scenes, you know, um, I don't want to say do you ever get jealous, but do you ever, you know, feel a certain way when that artist goes on to turn that song into a hit and, and, and gets all the fame and you're pretty much, you might not get as much recognition? Does that ever make you feel some type of way? Uh, no, because that's that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I never really actually, you see, when I originally decided I wanted to be a producer, I didn't know that producers could be famous anyway. Yeah. It was only in the era when Teddy Wiley came along, and you know, I, you know, I guess Prince to some extent right before that, when he had his couple of groups, the Apollonia Six, the Vanity, and all of those folks, and then Teddy Wiley came along. So people, he ushered into me the era of the producer. Mm-hmm. But before that, when I was making the decision to be a producer, I wasn't ever aware that those folks really got any notoriety anyway. So, so the music was all that ever mattered to me. That's the reason why my relationship with Cheryl worked so well because I had no interest in the limelight. I, I, you know, I just want to make music. I'm not, I was never interested in being famous. Yeah. And, and to some extent that was to my detriment because, you know, a lot of people didn't know who I was even though I did records that they knew but because I never went, I never made any effort to bring any of the attention to myself. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, I love music. I don't necessarily love you know, the, 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 the assumed stereotypical lifestyle that would come along with what people think of when they think of a record producer or whatever. I never even thought about that. Yeah. I just loved making the music. And if you're able to take that and, and move on and, and make something with it, that was the whole point. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. I never aspired to be an artist, so, mm-hmm. you know, I never cared. Yeah, because I, I, from my point of view, I'm the type of person, uh, you know, I buy an album, I immediately open up the, and read the liner notes, see who wrote each song so you produced it the instruments that really interests me and, and and I just you know my thing is I wish producers could get more of the spotlight because th- some of them are even more talented than the artists in some sense who the artist doesn't even write the song themselves and if you, you know what I'm saying and I, I, I agree that that there you know like to me um, uh, I would say that getting a nod from my peers means a lot to me but yeah. if I'm able to produce a song that takes the artist to the next level then to me that's like mission accomplished yeah. I did what I was supposed to do and I think that that's in much the same way plenty of times engineers don't get the you know the, the notoriety mm-hmm. that perhaps they deserve because they take something that doesn't sound stellar when they get it and they turn it into something that sounds great but I'm okay with that I mean I actually thought about doing it like a producer series of records where I would take you know producer friends of mine like the Chucky Bookers of the world and you know folks like that that are friends that, that I know would make great records but never you know just haven't been doing it yeah. and I would do something on them and they would they would actually make records that are there sort of like the Norman Connors used to do in the 70s yeah. where it was his record but he had like people sing the songs and you know all of that kind of stuff but um, I just never came into the game you know for that reason um, I looked at Gerald as a brand and plenty of times, you know, and this is off the record, but yeah. <laughs> plenty of times I saw him talk about, you know, what inspired him to write a song in an article or in an interview, and I was the one that wrote the song. Yeah. Uh, but the bottom line is, I understood that he was the brand, and so if the brand did well, we both did well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that's kind of like how I had to look at it, and I, I never had any problems with looking at it that way. You uh, know, it's that's the brand and so if the notoriety goes to the brand yes there is some there is some um, risk in that like if my name was on a record next to Charles then the average lay person may assume that he was the talent Mm -hmm. but then I would have to say to them you idiot why would you put my name on a record if I didn't do the work you wanted the Tony Nichols demographic or something like really (laughs) it's like you're not thinking it's like he wouldn't there would be no reason for him to put me down if I didn't do the work because yeah. it's not cause, you know it's like not many people know who I am so there was there would be no benefit for him doing that yeah but I never cared I just yeah. never cared okay that's very fair cool so yeah that's pretty much you know all I had prepared um you know is there, is there anything else you'd like to add um but thanks for caring man thanks for yeah. being there thanks for giving me 
me a chance to say, you know, what's on my mind because, you know, stuff like this makes all the difference in the world that, that somebody out there even cares, man. It's, it's, it's cool. It's a great thing. And uh, I'm having a ball, man. Yeah. That's, that's like all the best way I can put it. Cool. Right, and, and I wish you the best of luck in the future, and I'm going to definitely, you know, check out and, uh, you know, help promote your future projects. Okay, I appreciate it. If you come across somebody you think that could, you know, is, you know benefit from what I'm doing, send them my way. Okay, cool, definitely. Thanks again for taking the time okay. for the interview. Good to talk to you, man. Take care. Take care, man.